Washington, D.C. This is the Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Hannah Zuberi. Our top story tonight the death toll in the ISIS Khorasan terrorist attack at Kabul's international airport yesterday has increased to 162 Afghans killed and 150 wounded. 13 American soldiers were also killed. 18 injured in the twin suicide bombings. President Joe Biden has ordered military commanders to develop operational plans to strike ISIS-K assets, leadership, and facility. The White House said early Friday that 12,500 people have been evacuated from Afghanistan in the previous 24 hours, despite the attack, as the U.S. continued its evacuation mission. The U.S. military and the Taliban are controlling the crowd at the airport. The Taliban kept crowds further away from the airport's entrance gates. The American military has resumed evacuation flights. China, Russia, and Pakistan are among the nations condemning the attack. China has asked the Taliban to ensure the security of all people. The United Kingdom, Germany, Australia, and New Zealand have ended evacuation missions from Kabul. In the meantime, about 20,000 Afghans are entering Pakistan through the land border. Democratic Representative Ilhan Omar, in an opinion piece on CNN, wrote that as a refugee, I want America to open its arms to those fleeing Afghanistan. The UN calls the humanitarian situation in Afghanistan catastrophic. Kabul's suicide attack has deepened the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. More details in this report. These people were waiting for a flight to take them out of Afghanistan. For days with no rest or sleep, they were waiting, waiting for the flight that may come or may not. This is when ISIS-K found its opportunity, hiding in the midst of almost hungry, waiting people they struck. Suicide bombers and gunmen killed more than 162 Afghans and 13 Americans. Hundreds were wounded. These Afghans neither reached the Western Paradise nor escaped from the Taliban. They are in a better place now at the hands of God. The bombings claimed by ISIS Khorasan injected further panic into the Afghans' daily life. 100,000 have left Afghanistan, but 38 million Afghans remain in Afghanistan. The UN believes at least one-third of the population faces hunger there. That is 13 million people. This is the reason the UN is calling the humanitarian situation in Afghanistan catastrophic. It is appealing for 800 million to prevent hunger in Afghanistan. The UN also says that they are in urgent need of medical supplies and shelter supplies. German Chancellor Angela Merkel said Wednesday that the international community must maintain dialogue with the Taliban. In a speech to the German parliament, she said our goal must be to preserve as much as possible what we have achieved in terms of changes in Afghanistan in the last 20 years. She added that this is something that the international community must talk about with the Taliban. Progress made over the years include access to basic necessities. According to the World Bank, 70% of Afghans now have access to drinking water as opposed to 20% a decade ago. Nine out of 10 people have electricity up from just 2 out of 10 in 2011. Merkel emphasized that having the Taliban back in power is bitter, but we have to deal with it. A coalition of Muslim groups in the United States have voiced support for their country's withdrawal from Afghanistan. The U.S. Council of Muslim Organizations, or USCMO, hailed President Joe Biden's decision to withdraw the U.S. military from Afghanistan by August 31st. It also urged President Biden and the U.S. Congress to also pull back any American armed forces deployed over the past two decades in the war or terror in the Middle East and elsewhere. 
In addition, it called on all actors in Afghanistan, including the Taliban, to materially demonstrate the values of Islam. They said this can be achieved by pursuing a sincere and just reconciliation that includes and respects all people of Afghanistan, especially Afghan women. The organization also urged President Biden and U.S. Congress to seize all American support for dictatorship, unrepresentative factions, and military juntas. The USCMO is a coalition of national, regional, and local Muslim organizations and Islamic institutions in the United States. Earlier this week, Iraq launched a security operation to hunt down ISIS militants north of the capital, Baghdad. ISIS militants have an active presence 50 kilometers north of Baghdad from where they launched attacks inside the Iraqi capital. ISIS terrorists have in recent months escalated their attacks, especially in the area between Kirkuk, Salahuddin, and Diyala, known as the Triangle of Death. Suspected ISIS militants recently also attacked an oil field in Iraq's northern Kirkuk province. In 2017, Iraq declared victory over ISIS by reclaiming all territories the terrorist group controlled since the summer of 2014. This was estimated to be about a third of the country's territory. The governor of Nigeria's central plateau state, on Wednesday reinstated a 24-hour curfew in a local government area. This was after 36 people were killed in a fresh attack by gunmen. The murders took place in Jos North, where several houses were also set ablaze, according to the Anadalu Agency. The curfew was first declared in the region on August 15th. This was after Muslim worshippers were attacked. The governor has appealed to citizens to cooperate with the government by abiding by the curfew. Security agencies have been mandated to ensure that those who violated the curfew are arrested. The Hausa Fulani tribe, who number tens of millions across Nigeria, are mostly Muslim. They're seen as a threat by some of the smaller, predominantly Christian tribes. The Portland Police Bureau charged a 65-year-old man from Gresham, Oregon, over a gunfight in the city's downtown during violent clashes on Sunday. Authorities say Dennis Anderson drew a concealed handgun and shot at a group of anti-fascists who were trying to expel him from the area. At least one of the anti-fascists shot back, according to authorities, with seven shots exchanged between the two sides. The gunfight in Portland is intensifying concerns over an escalating violence during the contentious rallies in the city, Proud Boys and members of other far-right groups regularly and openly carry handguns during protests. The group hosted a Summer of Love event in Portland outside of an abandoned Kmart parking lot. The event quickly became violent when they destroyed multiple vehicles, including flipping over a disability van. Anti-fascists and leftists fought them back as police presence was nowhere to be found. Paintballs, fireworks, batons, bear mace, and other weapons, as well as live handgun rounds, were fired in public spaces. At the event, Speaker Randy Ireland told far-right attendees to go back to Washington, D.C.'s Capitol for a rally on September 18th. This will be to release their political prisoners who were arrested on January 6. A group of seven U.S. Capitol Police officers on Thursday filed a 71-page lawsuit against former President Donald Trump. It accuses him of conspiring with far-right groups and intentionally sending a violent mob on January 6 to disrupt the congressional certification of the presidential election. The suit is filed in federal court in Washington, D.C. It alleges that Trump worked with white supremacist, violent extremist groups, and campaign supporters to violate the Ku Klux Klan Act. The lawsuit was filed on the officer's behalf by the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. It names the former president, the Trump campaign, Trump ally Roger Stone, and members of far-right groups like the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers, who were present at the Capitol and in Washington on January 6th. 
The Supreme Court late Thursday blocked the federal moratorium on evicting renters during the coronavirus pandemic. The Biden administration had announced a rent moratorium extension earlier this month. The current one was due to expire in early October. A group of landlords have been fighting the moratorium. Representative Cori Bush from St. Louis, Missouri, has led the campaign for the extension. She tweeted that she and a group of supporters were outside the Capitol for five days through rain, heat, and cold. She said if they think this partisan ruling is going to stop us from fighting to keep the people housed, they are wrong. Congress needs to act immediately for every unhoused or soon-to-be unhoused person in our districts. Michigan Congresswoman Debbie Dingell had asked for the FBI and DHS to audit the no-fly list and the terror watch list. In a letter addressed to the two agencies, she stressed that the audit was needed to ensure innocent American citizens were not wrongly included. These lists were created in the aftermath of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. They institutionalized the discriminatory treatment of Muslims. Removing a name and this designation on the list is almost impossible. Many people were not aware that their names were listed until they attempted to travel. No explanation is provided beyond being not allowed to travel by air. The Texas House of Representatives passed a controversial and sweeping election bill on Friday. Democrats who fled Texas to deny quorum to Republicans did not have enough votes to defeat the Republican majority in favor of the legislation. The new law will create hurdles to limit participation in elections. It restricts methods of voting and tightens the rule around mailing ballots. The measure also outlaws successful drive-through and 24-hour voting. The legislation is part of the nationwide efforts by Republicans to impose new restrictions on voting access. This has been influenced by former President Donald Trump's false claim of fraud in last year's presidential election. U.S. courts have not found any evidence that the claims of widespread fraud. Lieutenant Kamil Varaich accepted the Law Enforcement Association of the Year Award this week. The Ashbury, New Jersey officer is founding president of the Muslim American Law Enforcement Association. The award was presented by Violence Intervention Prevention Specialist, retired police captain, Donna Roman Hernandez. The New Jersey-based association provides training, mentorship, and promotes diversity in the field of law enforcement. A different organization, the NYPD Muslim Officers Society, is the nation's first Muslim fraternal organization. Turkey and Pakistan are set to co-produce a television series on the life of Sultan Salahuddin al Ayyubi. He's a revered Muslim general, popularly known in the West as Salahuddin. The series will feature actors from Turkey and Pakistan. It will be shot in Turkey and is expected to run over three seasons. Salahuddin defeated a massive army of Christian crusaders and recaptured Jerusalem in 1187. He's celebrated by Muslims and many Westerners for his political and military skills, as well as his generosity and chivalry. The film is a private venture between a Pakistani company and a Turkish company. Coming up next after the break is our in-depth analysis segment, so stay tuned and we'll be right back after these messages. If I could be you, and you could be me for just one hour. If we could find a way to get inside each other's minds. Walk a mile in my shoes. Walk a mile in my shoes. Well, before you abuse, criticize, and accuse. Walk a mile in my shoes. Despite the development of a COVID-19 vaccine, millions around the world will not have access. We need a vaccine that's free and available to everyone, everywhere. It's time for a people's vaccine. Welcome back. 
welcome back. Right-wing politicians in France, like Darmani, have opposed the government's move to provide refuge to Afghan nationals. To discuss this topic about Afghan refugees in France, we have with us Yasser Swati. He's a French human rights and civil liberties advocate, community organizer, and a political analyst. Welcome, Yasser. Thank you for having me. So we've been you know, following the news and we hear what is there Afghan refugees currently on the streets in Paris. Can you tell me how they have been treated? Well, very badly. As a first, they were always called and identified as unwelcome aliens into France. For many of them, it was an invasion of people, of undesirable people. And this discourse came not only from the far right, but also the mainstream conservative party. And to make things even worse, uh, supposedly the French left bought into this narrative and beyond speaking of undesirable individuals, hunted these people, especially in the city of Paris. Paris is under the uh, mayorship of Anne Hidalgo, a socialist uh, mayor, and herself she made has turned people's lives from the migrant communities impossible. For example, if you're an Afghan refugee or you know African refugee, she made it impossible for them to set up uh, you know tents um, on the sidewalk when they apply for shelter. There is uh, no room when they apply for uh, paperwork. Uh, it takes uh, between two and three years for their papers to be processed. And the socialist uh, mayor of Paris went so far into criminalizing the Afghan refugees that she had brought in huge rocks to be put on the sidewalks in order to prevent Afghan refugees from being able to sleep on the sidewalk while, for example, waiting in front of the building of the um, of France Terre d'Asile, which processes their refugee statuses. So here we have this you know, humongous hypocrisy in France towards Afghanistan. So France did not think twice before sending troops to bomb civilians over there, supposedly against, uh, in, in the name of the war against terror, with the results that we all know in terms of civilian casualties and civil liberties. But when Emmanuel Macron spoke of Afghanistan, it didn't take him two minutes before speaking of an, inf an influx of, uh, or an almost an invasion-like uh, flow of uh, Afghan refugees. He didn't speak of the uh, human tragedy taking place over there. France's responsibility in destabilizing uh, uh, Afghanistan. And on top of it, the fact that for three years, uh, these people have not been treated very well. And just to finish, to give you a few, fi a few figures, <coughs> excuse me, just uh, to give you a few figures, around uh, 10,000 Afghan refugees have sought asylum and barely 60% of them see their uh, demands uh, being processed. And among those, to make things even worse, they fall under the so-called Dublin Accords, which means they will, they will have to apply in the country that has first registered them in Europe. So if they are in France, for example, and they were registered in Italy or in Greece, they will have to be sent back over there. So how is France truly taking with the, this matter seriously? I really don't know. But honestly, this is also a moment of shame for this country. What, what has the reaction been to Macron's statement? Uh, many people in France were indeed uh, shocked by his uh, discourse that in the midst of a human tragedy unfolding before our eyes, uh, that Emmanuel Macron would take the stage, excuse me, I, I will have to be blunt, as if his word matters on the international scene, but he took the stage to play into again into the far right rhetoric that we will have to fight uh, against uh, incoming uh, refugees. So the reactions were split. Some people praised it. Some said it wasn't enough. But also many people were shocked that Emmanuel Macron would be so heartless and have such short memory, in uh, i.e. that France bears a responsibility over what's going on today in Afghanistan. And how has um, the Afghan woman being used in the rhetoric against Afghan men um, 
and this hypocrisy that you're talking about? Oh, well, this is, you know, typical white uh, saviorism that, you know, they were out there to uh, save women uh, uh, for, uh, in, from Afghanistan. But when Afghanis uh, uh, ask for asylum in France, they are unwelcome. So, of course, they use the same colonial rhetoric that we are going to defend uh, Afghan women against uh, uh, Afghan men, but in the meantime, when these Afghan women seek asylum in France, they are unwelcome. The same thing, you know, with Arab women and throughout uh, the former uh, colonies, African women as well, that it allows white men to feel empowered that they are in a God's, you know, uh, given a mission to save uh, uh, non-white uh, women. But in the end, uh, nothing good comes out of it. You know, they are just being used uh, to legitimize Islamophobia on the one hand and further put, you know, white, you know, supremacy as the norm that these women need the assistance of white people. I would hope that France would support, for example, all the organizations that come to help Afghan refugees in the streets of Paris instead of, you know, posing as the saviors of the Afghan people at the same time, not opening their doors when they seek asylum. That was going to be my next question. Question: How are the, how is the French Muslim community reacting to uh, the new um, refugees that are coming in and the refugees that have been on the ground for three years? Uh, could you share with us what uh, here in the United States, many of the shops, the uh, ethnic stores, ethnic Muslim stores have boxes out collecting donations um, outside mosques? Is what's the scene like in France? Well, uh, I will have on this one to be quite uh, blunt again when it comes to Islamic organizations. Now, grassroots organizations have been indeed doing the best they could in order to provide a shelter, to provide food, provide assistance, and sometimes even psychological uh, support. But unfortunately, we do not see mosques opening their doors to Afghan refugees. I mean, even any, any refugee coming to knock on their door, and it is not a coincidence that refugees would go and knock on the door of churches and not mosques, because mosques, unfortunately, do not welcome them. Mosque, you know, uh, uh, managers and heads of mosques do not feel concerned by uh, the, the topic. And unfortunately, we see, of course, all this rhetoric about um, so-called, you know, the, the brotherhood of, uh, uh, between Muslims, etc. But we see nothing of it. So the people who have power among Muslims are doing absolutely nothing. But the help is coming from everyday citizens who have a, who have a sense of responsibility in, term, in, in, in terms of having to not only assist refugees, but also to remember that they are, of course, in a much more comfortable situation than those people crossing half the world to seek asylum in a foreign country. You're um, absolutely right about that. The that the responsibility lies not just with the governments, but with the people as well. We are just at being living in Muslim in uh, the Western world. Uh, our taxes were used to bomb um, and displace Afghans, and we do have a responsibility. What would you like to see um, more from um, the French Muslim community as well as from the government uh, before we? Well, for, from the government first, that they take their responsibilities, that instead of sending bombs abroad, they should be sending more economic help to help people avoid a situation where they were, you know, pushed towards asylum and exile. All the people living in African nations and Asian nations uh, do not do so because, you know, they are happy to do it and because they are just looking for uh, material wealth. They do it because they are either fleeing war, dictatorship, starvation, instability. And France has a huge responsibility in that, not only in Afghanistan, but also in, in throughout you know, Africa. And France's responsibility keeps being uh, you know, pointed out by various NGOs, various investigations, various revelations. But at the same time, while France intervenes to destabilize the, these countries, it does nothing to welcome that misery it has created. So no, I mean, I, I do not blame a person who risks his or her life to cross the world and seek a better living for himself or herself or their children. As for, you know, uh, communities in France, be it religious communities or non-religious communities, they have to understand that their com the comfort they live in is acquired on the back of the suffering of other people. And I'm going to again quote to you, for example, the former president of France, 
Jacques Chirac, a few years before uh, passing away, he admitted in an interview that the money French people have in their pockets, a huge part of it comes from Africa. And today, if France can you know, pose as a wealthy nation and pretends to be a country where people have a decent uh, living, it, you know, people in France have to understand that this comes at a cost. And that cost is being you know, uh, 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 borne by people in the so-called third world. And now, right now, you mentioned uh, you know, communities. Let's speak about the Muslim community. I do not like to... You know, speak of the Muslim community. I don't think it exists as such. There are Muslim communities uh, throughout uh, France, and I think it is their responsibility to apply pressure on imams, on clerics, on public figures, on people, on, on uh, people, um, rectors of mosques. So they would welcome these refugees, not only for shelter or food, but also to offer them opportunities to properly integrate. These people come oftentimes that don't speak the language, that don't know the culture, they have no one around. And if supposedly religious communities constantly lecture the rest of the world on hospitality towards the poor, and that the prophets before were poor people, and that they were helped by, you know, and supported by others, you know, the rich and the very few wealthy people who helped them, then do your job. And don't shut the mosque when a person comes knocking on the door just seeking a help. And I, and I recall in my neighborhood on, on the south side of Paris, many times you would see Iraqi refugees, you know, uh, Afghani refugees, uh, Somalis, or for example, people from the Ivory Coast or other countries in the sub-Saharan Africa would be literally unwelcome. So how shameful it is to use the name of a Muslim community when you have other Muslims coming from war-torn countries and then seek help and you, and you deny them. And at the same time, you pause and say, oh, well, we care about Muslims abroad. First, care about your community, and that community also cares about these refugees. And again, I cannot highlight it enough. Imams have a huge responsibility. And I know as a human rights activist, it is not my position to call on clerics to intervene. But we need all the help we can get and uh, uh, mosques and imams are not, you know, a foreign entity or in living in a bubble. They are part of this society. And, this, and if this society requires us to show solidarity towards the poor and the people fleeing, fleeing wars abroad, then so do mosques, synagogues, churches, imams, rabbis, and, you know, priests. And again, I repeat, open your doors. One day or another, you might face the same hardship and you would be happy someone is out there to give you a helping hand. Well, thank you so much for your time and for your words. Uh, this is a message to uh, those of, in our audience watching, open your doors. Even here, there will be, is an influx of uh, unaccompanied children who have come into the United States and need foster homes. They need uh, parenting. They need people who can uh, take them into their homes so they get, don't get lost um, in the secular world. So as uh, anchors at a Muslim Network TV, we urge the community here and in Canada to take in and be responsible for these refugees who are coming in. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Yasser, for your time. And um, you. as we move on to our next segment, uh, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back after the break. Our fellow Americans. Right now, the COVID-19 vaccines are available to millions of Americans. And soon, they will be available to everyone. The science is clear. These vaccines will protect you and those you love from this dangerous and deadly disease. They could save your life. So we urge you to get vaccinated when it's available to you. That's the first step to ending the pandemic and moving our country forward. It's up to you. Dad? 
Are you okay? I'm fine, dear. Your hero needs you now, and AARP is here to help. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. Welcome back. To discuss the latest surge in COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations in the United States, let's go to Imam Abdul Malik Mujahid. Over to you, Imam Mujahid. Thank you, Hina. The pandemic of the unvaccinated continues. Today, 156,296 new cases and 1,233 people who have died in the last 24 hours. Hospitalization in America is higher than it was last August. What's going on? Are we ever going to fight? Are we ever going to win this fight with the pandemic? With us is an expert, Dr. Rachel Ropper. Welcome to Muslim Network TV. Thank you. Dr. Rapper is a professor of microbiology and immunology at East Carolina University. So do you agree that it is really a pandemic of the unvaccinated? Yeah, definitely. Uh, the people that are vaccinated, if they do catch it, they have usually you know, no problem with the infection. It's just like a cold. But the people who are unvaccinated can be hospitalized and die. And those are the people that are filling up our hospitals now. As you said, there's more than 100,000 people hospitalized with COVID today in the US, even though we have a vaccine that works. So what, did, uh, what does the future looks like? I mean, uh, President Biden uh, came because the mismanagement of President Trump was the issue, he said, and he's gonna manage that. Is there anyone who can manage the pandemic? Well, I think, you know, you can you can give good information to the public, but if the public doesn't listen to it and get vaccinated, you can't protect them unless, you know, we have a mandate, which a lot of people don't want to have that kind of mandate. So, you know, the old saying, you can lead a, a horse to water, but you can't make it drink, right? We, we can give people information, but if they won't take the vaccine, they can't be protected from the vaccine. So you sound like you have given up on people really going for vaccine. <laughs> no, no, I never give up on people. We have to keep working to get good information out there. People need to know that COVID is real. It's very serious. It can kill you. And the vaccines are safe and effective. And, you know, there's a lot of fake information out there. And, these, you know, the poor public is getting this bad information. Um, so we need to make sure to do everything we can to get good information out to people. So, I mean, that is being tried. There are advertisements, there are celebrities. What else can be done? Yeah, we just have to keep trying. And I think, you know, a lot of people trust their, their own physicians. And so they, people should go to their physician and talk to their physician about it and get the real information. Because, you know, when they just hear things on, you know, on social media or, you know, YouTube, uh, they don't know what to believe. So if you talk to your doctor about it, um, that's a, a good source of good information. The, the other thing is, you know, we have the, the U.S. government, the Center for Disease Control, the National Institutes of Health, and those are large groups of scientists and physicians who care about taking care of Americans and their health. And then so you can trust them and listen to them. The other side is, you know, we have to realize that there are foreign countries who are spreading misinformation in order to hurt our citizens, in order to hurt our country and make themselves look better. So you kind of, you have a choice. You can listen to the US government, physicians and scientists, researchers, the experts, or you're probably getting foreign propaganda and fake news from somewhere else. What are the fake news from other countries which is coming to the United States? I thought we control the media and we have the Hollywood. 
Oh, no, no, not at all. Yeah, I think just last week, I think it was Facebook took down hundreds of Russian accounts that were shown to be spreading fake news about vaccines there. And there were there were hundreds, I think hundreds of thousands of US followers who were following these fake Russian accounts. So we know this is happening and, and has been happening for a long time. Hmm. So <clears throat> I mean, we had a war on drugs and there was a whole lot of money spent on it. Then, uh, you know, we have different wars, war and terrorism and all that. Do you think pandemic gonna be that type of a war which will just go on and on? I think that the virus is so widespread now that there's no way we can eradicate it from humans. I think it is endemic now. We will have COVID in the human population forever, but we will have vaccines that are effective um, like we do now. Um, and hopefully it will be, you know, like a cold or maybe, you know, like a, a flu. So it is endemic. It's here to stay. Um, I don't think there's any way we can population since 2003. So this is the third jump into humans. Um, and this is obviously the worst one. Um, the first SARS coronavirus came out in 2003. And we were able to control it with public health measures, just quarantine and, and isolation and masking. Um, this one is much more contagious and it's evolving to become even more contagious. Now we have the Delta variant that's six, seven times more contagious than the original. So um, yeah, this, this virus is gonna be here to stay and we're gonna have to manage it with vaccines um, and hopefully we can get it under control. So, Management is seems to be the part of it that America want uh, all of us to get a booster shot. Um, do you think the boosters will be coming every six months? Because it seems to, uh, you know, it, it's 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 its system seems to weaken within a few months. Right. Yeah. So some of the vaccines for, for SARS coronavirus are completely new. The RNA vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna are completely new. And so we really didn't know how long they would last. Um, the Johnson & Johnson is a more tried and true platform vaccine. But of course, they're all new because this is against a new pathogen. The, the SARS coronavirus, too, causes COVID-19. So um, and immunity does wane over time. And the other thing, the weird thing about coronavirus is is that they're known to cause reinfections. And that's not typical with all viruses. A lot of viruses, you know, you get it once and, and you're gonna be protected for life. But coronaviruses, you know, we really don't understand why they can cause re repeated reinfections. So um, the good thing is that coronaviruses don't mutate and change their genomes as much as influenza does. Influenza is almost completely new every year, which is why we have to get a new shot every year. Coronaviruses don't mutate like that, but they do mutate slowly over time. And actually, you know, this one has just jumped into humans, so its mutation rate or the selection for it is moving more quickly. So I don't know, you know, if we can get everybody vaccinated and get the incidence down, then everybody will be protected and we won't need so much vaccination all the time. Right now, COVID is just on fire um, in the US and many places around the world. So you have to have a high level of protection or you're gonna get it because it's just everywhere. And so that's one of the reasons that, that we are boosting now. So why do you think uh, this virus keep getting stronger? I mean, you mentioned the Delta virus, which originated in India, uh, is um, seven times uh, more infectious. So is that a gain of function theory applies to it becoming stronger? So viruses have to do two things to survive in nature. They have to replicate themselves, reproduce, and they have to spread. So any virus that can do those two things better will, will come out and have a selective pressure. It'll beat out all the other viruses, <clears throat> excuse me, all the other viruses that aren't as good at replicating and spreading. So this is just normal evolution. Um, the viruses that are better at replicating and spreading will come out and take over, rapidly take over the other viruses. It's kind of, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint, it's very interesting because viruses are one of the few things that we can watch evolve in real time. And we're seeing that now with, with COVID. So the, what is the difference between a natural uh, mutation of viruses to become stronger and deadlier and the gain of function 
theory or science. So gain of function is what is a term phrase that we use when we have doing something in the laboratory and we like insert a gene so that something new can be done by that virus. Um, but that's really not, not what's happened with COVID or how it evolved. There's no evidence in the genome of any manipulation of the genome. I've, I've looked at both the SARS coronavirus one and, and SARS coronavirus two, which causes COVID. The genome looks completely normal, um, but normal evolution occurs so that things slowly become better and better at replicating and spreading and whatever they need to do to survive in nature. And, and that's what's happening with, with coronavirus. You know, mother nature is much better at making viruses than any, any uh, lab could do. Oh, so, so China and America should stop blaming each other and blame Mother Nature here? Yes, I, I'm really sad and surprised that anyone wants to blame a country for a virus, right? So the virus could evolve in your backyard, right? It's not your fault, right? But um, of course, we want governments to be responsible and, and take good care of their citizens and warn people when there are problems. And um, yeah, I certainly would not blame any government or any location for, for having a pandemic. And you know, the last pandemic, the, the H1N1 influenza pandemic started in North America on a pig farm. Nobody blamed us for that one. So I don't think it's fair to blame, blame the Chinese for the virus. And the Chinese scientists released the genome sequence January 11th. So they let the whole world know the genome sequence so everybody could start making vaccines against this virus. And the World Health Organization declared emergency, a world a global emergency at the end of January. So all the countries were warned at the end of January that this was a major concern. So tell us, Professor Ropper, so I shouldn't throw out my stock of masks and everything? No, I would, I would definitely keep using masks. The, the virus is so widespread right now um, that, and so many people have it, definitely. I think everyone should be wearing masks everywhere in public. I'm, I'm sorry, I've gone back to wearing a mask in public in the grocery stores or wherever we are. The masks really help a lot, but it's really important for them to cover your nose and your mouth. Um, you know, a lot of people are wearing them down here. That's not going to give you very good protection. You need to cover your nose and your mouth and try to make sure that it fits kind of tightly on the sides if you can. Thank you so much, Professor Hopper. I'm glad to help. Back to you, Hina. Thank you so much, Dr. Roper and Imam Mujahid. That's all from our Washington studios tonight. Thank you for tuning in. You can find previous episodes and more on our YouTube and Facebook. For more content, keep watching Muslim Network TV or visit muslimnetwork.tv. Assalamu alaikum and good night.